Good evening, good evening everyone. I'm Dr. Lori Peake, Director of Veterinary Programs for Maddie's Fund. We want to thank you for being with us tonight. We promise a fun-filled evening of exciting data, statistics, and flow-through planning. We at Maddie's Institute believe that collecting and analyzing data and implementing a plan to move animals through the, your shelter faster is the key to saving more lives. Tonight's webcast, In One Door and Out the Other, Practical Flow-Through Planning for Animal Shelters, is the second in our two-part series, Saving Lives by the Numbers, How Data Shows the Way. We are very proud and excited to have Dr. Elizabeth Berlinger, Director of Clinical Programs for Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program at Cornell University as our presenter tonight. Dr. Berlinger received her DVM from Cornell University in 2003. She worked as a veterinarian in private practice and in uh, uh, animal shelters in Baltimore, Maryland before returning to Cornell in January of 2010 as Director of Clinical Programs. She's also a consultant and lead field veterinarian for the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association's Rural Area Veterinary Services Program, which, is, which facilitates mobile spay, neuter, and preventative medicine clinics in rural areas of the United States that are without access to routine veterinary care. We'll be starting in just a few moments, but before we do, we have some housekeeping items we need to cover. Those of you attending this live webcast will have the opportunity to win one of 10 door prizes, a copy of Maddie's Infection Control Manual. We will draw the names after the webcast and will notify the winners via email, so good luck. Next, please take a look at the lower left-hand corner of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That is where you'll be asking questions during the presentation. Dr. Berlinger will answer as many of the questions as she can at the end of the presentation, but please don't hold your questions until then. Ask them all during the event. Questions asked at the last few minutes will probably not be processed in time for a response, so get yours in as soon as you can. If you need any help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the little question mark icon at the bottom of the page. This is the help icon. Or you can go to event.on24 forward slash view forward slash help. You also see other little images at the bottom along with the help button. These are widgets that will take you to the resources our presenter wanted to share with you tonight, as well as some shared by Maddie's Institute. Please be sure and check them out. Before I turn the mic over to Dr. Berlinger, I want to say a few words about Maddie's Fund, the leading funder of shelter medicine education in the United States. It's our goal to help save the lives of all our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. We received our inspiration for that goal from the unconditional love of a dog named Maddie. Her example led Dave and Cheryl Duffield to promise her they would honor that love by founding Maddie's Fund and helping make this country a safe and loving place for all her kind. It is our hope that you, too, will be inspired by Maddie to take what you learned here tonight and make that promise come true. Dr. Berlinger, thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Lori, for that introduction, and I'm very grateful to the Maddie's Institute for allowing me to speak on this topic this evening. Um, I also want to say that I know many of you have actually contributed to this um, presentation, both directly and indirectly, so you may see some of your own names in this presentation this evening, and I'll make sure to acknowledge you as we, as we go along. Um, I want to say that I'm really fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. I get to teach in a university and work with students, but I'm also on the floor of a shelter in our area, and um, our program directs their medical program, and so we're very much involved in the clinical work that happens in that shelter. And so being somewhat of a practical person, um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about some of the, the tips and techniques that we've, we've experimented with, basically, in our, in our shelters, and then been able to apply and really kind of measure success. Um, I'll tell you, I I'm, I'm, had said to Lori before this started, I'm much more comfortable talking to groups of 500 than talking to myself in a room looking at a computer, most often I'm, I'm very disappointed that there's no one to laugh at my jokes, and Lori promised she might try to help me out with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we will, we'll see how, we, how it goes. I'm also going to try to, uh, to uh, not confuse you as we go along. I generally am able to measure confusion by the looks on people's faces, and without that it's going to be a little difficult, but please do send your questions along, and I will do my best not to be confusing. So we're going to start with a poll. Okay, so the question is, who is out there this evening? Pick which category best applies to you. Shelter management, shelter veterinarian, shelter staff, shelter volunteer, member of a board of directors, and none of the above. So who is out there this evening? 
we like to ask this question. So I'm sorry we keep asking this question, but it is such a fun question to ask and know who's out there. Okay, so it looks like 15% of you are shelter management, 26% are shelter veterinarians, 9% uh, shelter staff, 19% shelter volunteer, 20, or I'm sorry, 12.3 members of the board, and 19% none of the above. Great. I, I put that in, and I know we ask it every time, but I was really curious to see what kind of balance we have out there today, and it looks, it looks really great that we have people kind of across the board. And I think that's really important um, in the sense that what I'm going to talk about really involves everybody who's involved in a shelter. It's not just a matter of medical staff or, or management staff. Um, and I'm really excited to see so many volunteers because I think that's often the hardest part of the puzzle in terms of communication. So this will be great. So I'm going to start with a little uh, schematic of flow through planning in our shelters. And I'm sure you guys have seen this before, a very simple cartoon of how animals kind of come to us. Um, so, and it's simplified because there are certainly other pathways. But we outline owner surrender and strays coming into our shelter. Um, and there's our shelter kind of in the center, the big square. With any luck, we have some that kind of turn around and go back to their owners. And I have foster as kind of a little diversion because some of them need to take kind of a long way around before they get to leave. And then they go out through a variety of methods, but our main ones I listed were adoption, transfer, and euthanasia. And so my focus this evening is really focusing on that box, although I will, I will vary from that at certain points of the presentation in terms of looking at things that really affect that box. But I'm hoping to kind of stay within that box um, and look at what we can do to move animals more quickly on that pathway. Um, I want to specifically say something, obviously, adoption and transfer. Adoption's one of our biggest goals, transfer for adoption. We certainly want to emphasize that. When it comes to euthanasia, the focus there is really, one, hoping to decrease euthanasia um, by decreasing our length of stay and keeping our animals healthy and decreasing overcrowding. And the other is to, when appropriate, make euthanasia decisions in a timely fashion so that we don't have animals that have remained in our shelters and then ultimately are euthanized if we should have made that decision earlier. Um, and so as the cartoon goes along, we hope that that arrow actually gets smaller. So flow through pan planning, like I implied in the beginning, really involves everyone. So who's involved? Medical staff. That's easy for me to say I'm a veterinarian and I'm there, so I'm going to involve myself. Anyone who knows me knows that it's hard to keep me out of such things. Um, certainly the behavioral staff play a key role. Adoptions, in terms of their impact on moving animals towards that arrow. Operations are key. Your foster coordinator is a big part of that. Your intake staff, and the truth is everyone's involved. And although a lot of the strategies we talk about in the shelter may not involve volunteers directly, some of them do. Um, and so although I didn't include them on the list as I was thinking about the people who are kind of sitting around those, tape, those staff meetings, they're certainly an important part of the picture. And in terms of the flow, flow through planning, the what, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the fact that moving animals through your shelter can actually require a little bit of a cultural shift. And this isn't going to surprise anybody who spent time in shelters, and most of you, I'm sure, have. Um, but sometimes it can be tricky to kind of shift thinking or shift the culture of the shelter if what you are doing has worked to this point. Um, but I think the big question in this is always thinking about what can we do better, and that may require a shift in thinking. Um, sometimes it means thinking of the shelter a little more as a system, and that may be new um, to your shelter if everyone has kind of been given their task or job and they kind of work on that task or job and communication may be difficult. But you really need to think about the fact that you have animals moving through a working system, an organism of some, in some ways, and living at times, it seems. Uh, thinking of the shelter as a business. I do not have a business background. I do not have a management background. And truthfully, this was something that didn't come immediately to me. Um, but the point is, is that our shelters are businesses. They do have limited resources. Um, and we want to spend those appropriately. And, and we're in the business of saving lives, is what I like to say. And so I think it's really important that that business aspect does come in. Obviously, flow through planning involves proactive population planning, something that you are planning ahead of time and, and 
taking proactive strategies to improve. And it goes from the system's large scale level down to the individual level of the animal. And it really involves full staff enrollment in order to be effective. Um, it takes a village to accomplish a change like this. And I kind of think about it that almost every success, and this is going to be a joke that no one can, but not really, is that almost every success that I've experienced in my life has started with a strange idea that popped into my head, quickly followed by my own sense that there's no way it could possibly work. Um, and then ultimately by a commitment to see the plan through and see what happens. Because it seems like it could work even if I doubted that it could. And I have to say that there are plenty of times I get into these situations and I wonder how the heck did I get here and why did I start this path. And I find that's true in the shelters too, in initiating change, that a lot of times you kind of come up against a wall and people may say to yourself, this is, they may say to you, this is never going to work. And you have to decide whether you're going to think that's true or not or whether they're going to be able to kind of accept that this may be something that actually does work in the long run, even if it doesn't work tomorrow. Um, my common response, even when I am worried that something may not work out all right, is to repeat the mantra, wow, this is going to be great. This is going to be really great. And my interns know now that if they hear me saying that repeatedly, that uh, they may be finding themselves in a little bit of trouble. Um, but most of the time, it really does turn out to be great. And so I, I'm going to stick with that plan for a while. It can be really difficult to lead a change in a group of people. And I likely don't need to tell any of you this. Um, but as animal sheltering becomes more professionalized, there's a much better sense of it as a business. Um, and that we are in the business of pre-owned certified cats and saving lives. And to some degree, we need, to, we need to think about that. And that's not to say that we lose the heart or the emotion in it. But um, sometimes having somebody with business planning and an MBA around is not a, is not a bad thing. Um, and I had an ED come in at one point with an MBA, and I have to say I was a little nervous about it at first. But it was probably the best thing that happened to that shelter when I was working there. So a little bit about cultural shift. And again, I am not the expert on this. Um, but this is a quote that I like, to, I like to remind myself of. So individuals and groups seek stability and meaning. Once achieved, it is easier to distort new data by denial, projection, rationalization, or various other defense mechanisms that to change the, to change the basic assumption, than to change the basic assumption. Cultural change is difficult, time consuming, and highly anxiety provoking. And again, those of you who have been involved in this, in fact, I started talking to people as I was preparing this presentation. And I was saying, you know, I think for part of this, I really do need to touch on this fact that Sometimes this does involve changing the culture. It could be a change in staff or a change in mission. Even changing protocols are incredibly anxiety producing for people. And when I started talking to people about it, everybody had a story. Everyone had a story, most of them about um, other staff members or you know, working with management or working with volunteers. Quite a few people had stories about the horrible mistakes they made in trying to change culture. And I certainly can contribute to those. Um, but the truth is, is that sometimes you just need to keep plugging along um, and, and remain committed to what your mission is because you will see change. You will see progress. And the best thing is when you, when you get to the point where you find surprising supporters. Um, suddenly the staff member who was the most resistant to the change is now the one who has really bought into it because they see the difference that it makes. Um, and so I think I think it's really important to, to keep this in mind, that you really are moving a group and that no one can make changes like this on their own. Sometimes it's also hard to get across to the, to the group how a small change, what may seem like a small incremental change, can have big results. And again, that's partly what I'm going to look at today, is a bunch of small changes that may have big results when it comes to getting animals through your shelter more quickly and keeping them healthy. So we're going to move to another poll question to give me a little bit more of an idea of, of what you guys are working in. Great. So here's the, here's the question. The shelter I most closely work with is at this time at capacity, over capacity, under capacity, I'm not sure, and I don't work with a shelter, I just needed something to do tonight. So, if, okay, so here are the results. 30% said at capacity, 27% uh, said over capacity, 
33% said under capacity and 4% said I'm not sure and 7% said they don't work with a shelter. Nice. Um, this is great, actually. I'm really excited to see the breakdown. 30% are at capacity. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means because that's really interesting. 32% under capacity, which is even more interesting to me. I expected to see more over. And I expected to see some more I'm not sure. Um, so we'll work through a little bit what the definitions are. And the 6.5 of you, that's, that's exciting. I hope you're gathered around pizza and beer um, and enjoying the presentation. Maybe we should have a little bit of music playing for you as well. But um, nice. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to talk about capacity for care. And in defining capacity for care, I'm going to look to the standards document from the Association of Shelter Veterinarians. And this is two things pulled out of the population management section. And so there they define capacity as capacity to provide humane care has limits for every organization, just as it does in private homes. Effective population management requires a plan for intentionally managing each animal shelter stay that takes into consideration the organization's ability to provide care. So what I like about these two is one, recognizing that organizations do have a capacity for humane care. And two, looking at that and realizing that it's both at a population management level. So if you're effectively managing your population, you are intentionally looking at each animal shelter stay as part of that. And so I like the fact that it goes from the from the large scale system level down to that individual animal. And that gets back to that idea of small incremental steps can make big changes. Affecting one animal may actually affect your whole population. Um, and so that section, I think, is just really important to review. So in terms of defining capacity for care, I'm going to focus on three sections. Um, with more emphasis on the first two. So I'm going to talk a bit about physical capacity because, and what we're really looking at there is the number of appropriate housing units. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that because I've been in situations where I've asked shelters what their physical capacity is. And what they tend to give me are numbers either of how many animals they've actually housed or how many cages they have. Um, and that's not necessarily the same thing as what appropriate physical capacity is. I'll spend some time talking about care capacity. And what we're looking at there is really the labor and resources that you need in caring for the animals at the shelter. And I'll give you a formula, but literally it takes into account the hours that you have for care. And that may mean direct animal care. It may mean in-shelter services, such as spay neuter or behavior evaluations. Um, even foster can be, can be, you can use that same kind of um, formula. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about adoptions um, because there's a ton of information out there on webinars about increasing your adoptions and really changing that whole dynamic. Um, there is some discussion of adoption-driven capacity, and all of this, I have to say, has really come from Dr. Sandra Newberry, so I want to recognize her here at this point. And I will, again, as we move along. And I have her resources listed at the end so that you can spend some time on this, because this is by certainly not something that can be taught easily in the space of a webinar. But um, adoption-driven capacity is this idea that there is an optimal number of animals that you would have available for adoption based on what your target length of stay is, how many days you actually want animals to stay in the shelter, um, and your actual monthly daily adoptions. Um, and so looking at how many animals are adopted on a given day in a month, and then figuring out how many animals you actually have on the floor. Again, this can be fairly complicated, and so I don't want to spend too much time on that, um, but I will come back around to it as it affects what happens in the shelter. So let's break these down a little bit further. Uh, physical capacity. So the number of appropriate housing units. This is not the same thing as how many cages you have. And most of you, I'm sure, know that. Um, but I am, once in a while it comes up that people simply kind of go through and figure out how many cages they have. And what I want you to really look at, in spite of even if every cage is full right now, let's talk about your most appropriate housing units. In the ideal world, which ones would you be using and which ones really shouldn't you be using? 
And so you may look at this slide and say, okay, I have nine cages, so this should house nine animals. I would hope that nobody would say, well, I can house 18 animals because I have nine cages, but that sometimes has come up in conversation because that's what people have had to do in the past. Um, these cages, to give you a little bit of a background, these cages are 21 inches by 21 inches, if you're looking at the floor. Um, and these cages are, let's say they're in an infirmary. So they are in cat isolation, an upper respiratory ward. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, these are cages where animals will be housed for a minimum, cats will be housed for a minimum of 14 days. Um, and but I think that's fair. It could be longer um, if it's going to take them longer to recover from upper respiratory. The size of these cages is fairly small. So spot cleaning is going to be almost impossible in this size of cage, which means they'll have to be removed every day in order to have the cage cleaned, which is stressful. Um, it, the cages aren't large enough to separate really their food or their litter box, and they may need to have super small litter boxes. Um, and these are, these are animals that are sick already and under stress. And so most likely the reason these cages are in the infirmary is because there are a lot of sick cats and we need lots of cages for the sick cats. But the truth is, is this is probably the least acceptable housing for these cats because they're already under stress. Um, and if we could minimize their housing or ha their handling, we have a better chance of not passing that infectious disease along. So I'm going to continue kind of with this example. This is an actual capacity assessment um, from a shelter that was done by someone in management um, and somebody I have incredible respect for. And so when given the task of figuring out housing capacity, and I will say that this shelter was overcrowded at the time and over capacity, um, but the assessment was to figure out how many cages do we have. And so this was simply a counting cages exercise for areas. And I pulled a piece of it. So we're looking at the cat holding, and then there are two cat infirmaries that are reserved for upper respiratory disease. Um, we look at the holding units are broken down by numbers and sizes of cages. And then the recommended occupancy per holding unit, and it was broken down by cat versus kitten, figuring that we can house more kittens in those units um, than cats, again, depending on the size. And so litters of kittens um, would have a different figure. And then there's the maximum occupancy. So we have a recommended and a maximum, and then the maximum capacity for the room. And at the time this was done, every one of these cages was occupied. Um, they were full, and in terms of breakdown, that's hard to say in terms of cats versus kittens, but the, they were full. And so to try and imagine how to decrease the numbers in that area is really difficult when you're looking at all of these cages that are absolutely full and more cats coming through the door um, and an adoption center that's also full. And so sometimes it's really hard to think that it could ever go down, um, that you could ever get these numbers down. And so you think to yourself, well, these are, you know, it's a safe environment, it's a warm environment, they have food, they have water, but can we do better, I guess, is the question, and, and how can we strategize to decrease that population so that we can give them perhaps more appropriate housing? And so what I'm going to show you next did not happen overnight, but this is this, these are the same spaces in the same shelter after implementing many strategies for decreasing length of stay and keeping cats healthier, um, some of those being medical, some of those being behavioral, some of those being housing, and some of those simply being scheduling. And I'm going to talk about all of those different facets as we move along. But the items in red were pretty much the things that were eliminated from those rooms. And so as you notice, cats and kittens were all included in that capacity assessment. Um, in the process of consulting with this shelter, we pushed pretty heavily that kittens needed to be separated out, and there needed to be a separate kitten holding area, and there needed to be um, a increased management of the foster program so that more kittens were in foster, fewer kittens were in the shelter. Um, the kittens that were going through foster were kind of flow through foster care, um, similar to what was happening in the shelter, so that they were actually tracked and returned to the shelter in timely fashion. Um, managed in terms of how many of them were in homes, and um, any preventive strategies that could be done to keep them healthy put into place. And so in terms of, let's look, for instance, at the cat holding, 
those 26 small cages were converted, and I'll show you some pictures, um, with the schematics that UC Davis, particularly Dr. Janae Wagner, has worked on to make double-sided cages. And so shout out to Dr. Wagner, she happens to be out there, um, and to Dr. Hurley uh, for, for some of these ideas, because we did implement this, and it's made tremendous changes in those areas. Um, some of the small wire cages, those were collapsible dog crates that were open, um, and I know we've all been there. So this, again, this didn't happen overnight, but slowly one by one, I started with anything that was a collapsible dog crate. Once it became empty, it was collapsed and put away. And I'll tell the story because as I was doing that, um, particularly in one of the other rooms, there were many, many collapsible dog crates, and I started collapsing them one by one and putting them away, and there was a staff member who had been at the shelter for about six years who said to me, you know, you're just going to have to get them out again. I don't know why you're doing that. And I appreciate that because I know that she'd been there for six years and this had been a struggle all along, and to be honest, it was one of those moments, just like I described earlier with the cultural shift when I thought to myself, well, yep, I may have to get them back out again, but right now I'm putting them away. Um, and so we kept moving forward, and I'm happy to say I have not had to get out those small wire crates. Um, again, not something that happens overnight, many, many factors at play, but I do think it's a start to actually look at your housing and think, what is appropriate, what should we be using, and what shouldn't we be using? And that's at least a beginning to think about um, the physical spaces that you're working in, and at least a beginning to realize what may in fact be overcrowded spaces. And so I think what I had in the last slide came out to 86 spaces, and I mean, this is kind of a shocker. As I was doing this, I thought to myself, I don't know quite how we pulled this off, but in these spaces at least, we're down to essentially 38 spaces. Um, and that has worked with the, with the decreased length of stay and the, and the other things that we've put into place. Um, and so we've eliminated the kittens from cat holding. We've moved animals through those sections. And the cats are so much healthier that honestly one of those infirmaries has been empty for a good long while, and we've actually used it for other purposes. These are those same cages with the portholes. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have seen these pictures already. That's the same bank of nine. Um, we originally opened up those two portholes. One of our board members is an engineer, and his idea, and I'm pointing at my own slide and realizing I don't have a pointer that you can see, but um, his original idea was, well, we don't want to lose that much capacity, so what we can do is drop a divider down the center of the center cages which didn't create a really great second space, but it did allow a litter box to go on the other side. Um, ultimately, we haven't had to put that, we never even engineered that divider because we haven't needed it. Um, and instead, these are beautiful giant condominiums that we use sometimes for, um, for kittens if they have upper respiratory and they're not out in foster. So we've left those all open and they basically get three cages, um, which is great. And so I've been really happy with that. The number of sick cats in the shelter has dropped tremendously. I don't have numbers on that this evening because they weren't recording, at least in the software, that they have medical status prior to when we started working with them. And so it's really hard to look at the rates of upper respiratory, other than the fact that I can say the two infirmaries that had 40 cages between them um, essentially now have uh, I think we're down to 18 cages, and that one infirmary has pretty much been shut down um, and has not had to house sick cats. So I can't give you exact numbers, but I encourage you to all start collecting your disease rates, just like Dr. Scarlett referred to last week. And it's certainly easier now with some of the software systems if you use the diagnosis field um, to be able to track that. So you can do this too. Um, and here's a closer up picture, and I haven't sent this along to UC Davis. I know they like to get some of these pictures. So here's our version of the ones in cat holding. These were small cats that are for uh, small cages that were converted to double-sided. We use these for stray holding since they're there for five days. It gives them the double-sided and allows the staff to work. We struggled a bit with the porthole covers, which I know Dr. Wagner has struggled with too. And what we ended up with was a ring of PVC and these fancy, lovely, um, Cheetah, those are placemats from the dollar store that we then glued onto the PVC ring and it pops onto the cover. Works really nicely because it doesn't stay on there with a nice fix, so it's great for covering the porthole, but you can't leave it on there because the cat will knock it off, which is exactly what we want. So we make sure that they continue to, to have their open spaces even if the staff forgets to remove that porthole after cleaning. 
Um, and those, those placemats, I just love them. And the interns found those on a trip to the dollar store one afternoon. Um, and this is in the main cat room, which has also, it was one of the rooms where I really knocked out a bunch of extra cages, and it has not had to have anything come back up. Um, these cages aren't ideal. Even though they're double-sided, they have room for a hide box and all of those other stress management techniques. They're outside the dog wards, and so there is some barking. So it's not the perfect place, um, as most of our places aren't. But it's, it's much better than it was. So a little bit of full disclosure here. My personal pet peeves, you already know one now, are wire crates with sheets over them. Um, I, it makes me crazy, and I realize we need them at times. We need them in crises, and we need them if we take in large cases, and sometimes we just need them. Um, but I always like to see them come down as quickly as possible. Uh, cages too close together make me a little crazy. Cages in bathrooms make me a little crazy. Um, and if a location in your shelter is the bathroom, and, and that's one of those places, that's one of your locations for animals, that always makes me a little uneasy too. Um, I understand, again, at times we may be pushed to that for a certain crisis or a certain event, um, but I don't think it should be kind of an ongoing place where we, where we keep animals. Uh, I much rather see us be able to move them through and, and try to keep them out of the bathrooms and, and in the wire crates outside of doors. So. Full disclosure, that is my personal pet peeve. Um, and I hope you can accept it anyway. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Raise your hand if you've done this too. And this is where if we were in a big large room and I could look at all of you, then I could actually know how many are raising your hand. But one of my favorite things to do is steal the doors off of cages that are super, super small. I think this one is 16 inches wide. And I declared no animal was allowed in there. And I know some of you have done this because I have been to your shelters and I've seen it. Um, and we threw away the door so no one could put it back on. And now that's where hand sanitizer and trifectant lives, because it's just not the right size for a cat to live in. Um, and so therefore, it becomes storage. And throwing the door away makes it a lot um, more permanent. And so I know you've done this too. So switching from physical capacity to care capacity, this is a matter of looking at the time that you have for care times the number of animals. And the time for care per animal times the number of animals, which then equals the required capacity for care. And I put it in minutes. I'm going back to my chemistry, my stoichiometry, making sure my labels match. Um, but it is important that you actually do some of this math and figure out how much time have you allotted per animal, and then how many animals do you expect to care for. And you can do this on a really basic level for just the direct care of the animals. Um, so HSUS has some minimal requirements. They say 15 minutes a day, which includes feeding and cleaning. Now, obviously, there are other things we want to do for the animals in our care, um, whether it's treatments, whether it's behavioral enrichment, whether it's just socialization or interaction. And some of that, a lot of that gets done by our volunteers, too, and we depend on them for that. But it's a way of actually looking at what are you providing and what do you need to be providing. You can use a version of this even in figuring out the time for care for spay-neuter. Um, Take one of your average days, figure out how long it really takes on average for each of those procedures, look at how many, the number of animals that you do, and are you meeting, do you have enough time, staff time in surgery to meet those needs? And so it's really somewhat of a flexible um, formula that you can use in multiple scenarios when you're talking about time um, for, for caring for those animals. Some basic truths. And you may or may not believe them at this point. But the truth is, is that capacity is inversely related to length of stay. If you decrease your length of stay, you can increase your capacity. And again, I'll show you some math. Um, and I credit Dr. Dr. Newberry again for saying this over and over and over again. Because I don't know about you, but when it comes to math, I need to hear it over and over and over again. Um, and you really can impact your length of stay. And I know for some of you, you're thinking, we simply can't. There is nothing else we can do. We can not make people adopt faster. We cannot work any faster. And what I'm going to say is there are some things you can do. Um, and it, it may take some creative thinking. But shelter medicine is creative problem solving 101. So I like to remind the students. Um, and so it may mean kind of really sitting back and trying to figure out exactly where, where the problems are. With shorter stays, you get healthier animals. They're physically healthier. They're behaviorally healthier. And so when it comes to any of these strategies, I, I come back to length of stay as being where I like to start. So here's Dr. Newberry's math. 
um, in terms of looking at. So if I'll go through this kind of quickly. But your daily intake, if you take in 10 animals a day and they stay for five days, then your daily population as you move along will be 50 animals because they're coming in and they're going out after five days. If you take in the same number of animals, 10 animals, and you keep them for 10 days, your daily population is now up to 100. And if you take in 10 animals and they stay for 20 days, your daily population is up to 200. And the question here is, what is your capacity? Um, you know, and again, thanks to Dr. Newberry for continuing to teach us math, because we need to be reminded. Um, in the next slide, I switch it around a little bit, because sometimes I, I have found in talking to shelters that sometimes if they, are used, if they don't really know what their capacity is and they're used to just taking care of anyone, any of the animals that come in and figuring out how to do it and putting up more cages, then it can be really hard to kind of understand capacity as, as a line in the sand that you, you want to draw. Again, we will all step over it in certain circumstances. But it can be difficult for them to understand that just because they have housed 250 cats in their adoption center does it, and they've done it and they and it worked it was okay but that doesn't mean their capacity is 250. the capacity should be something that in your head is more of a stable number that you are trying to stay within and so i switch the numbers around sometimes and talking to them and say okay we can care for a hundred cats and i'm just making this up this is your hypothetical shelter we can care for a hundred cats well with the facility that we have, the people that we have, the services that we have. If they stay for five days, then we can help 20 cats a day. And, there's, and I'll go over, there's some flex in this too, but if our capacity is 100 and they stay for 10 days, we can take in 10 cats a day. And if our capacity is 100 and they stay for 20 days, we can only take in five cats a day. Now granted, if you're taking in more cats, you're probably going to need to increase your care capacity because they need intake exams and all of these things. So it's not perfect science. But what I'm trying to do is, is help them understand that the capacity is not the flexible part of this equation. The length of stay is flexible. And if we decrease that, we can actually help more animals. Um, and it's not usually that traumatic. But it sometimes helps staff to understand a bit more, to be a bit more motivated to understand why that capacity really does need to be something that they don't want to go over. And that length of stay really is something that's driving their ability to help more animals. So the other thing that we like to touch on is that length of stay and health are also related. Um, and this graph, this actually was in Dr. Scarlett's presentation last week. And so I thought I'd pull it back out. Um, and without getting too much into the epi of it, what we're looking at here is one study in one shelter. And we're looking at the cumulative incidence of upper respiratory disease. And it's separated by age um, in this, but that's really not the important part of it overall. What I want to look at is what this is, is it, the, is it is the chance of a cat in a shelter breaking with an upper respiratory, the incidence of it occurring based on the day, it's the number of days it has been in the shelter. And so, as a cat gets sick, it kind of drops out of the denominator in this equation. And so what we're looking, what we're seeing is that the longer the cat is in the shelter, there's a greater probability that it will break with an upper respiratory infection. And on one level, you say, well, duh, it's there longer. It's been exposed to more disease. It's under more stress. We know this. And to some degree, we do know this. Um, but this is a really nice representation of it actually happening because we don't really know it until we, we track it. Um, and what we see here is that, indeed, they stay longer, they get sicker. Now there's also some parts you could argue that, well, they could have been exposed and then if they leave the shelter, they get sick at home and those animals aren't noted, and that's probably true. But this is still looking at the trend. Um, and there are two ways to look at this. Uh, glass half empty, you say, well, it makes sense, but what do you want me to do about it? I can't get them adopted any faster. Um, they stay in the shelter till they're adopted, and, and this is what I can do. I would argue glass half full interpretation, we start to say, well, you know, if we get some of these guys out of the shelter faster, in addition to changing some of the things that we're doing and reducing overcrowding, reducing fomite transfer, we may actually keep more of them healthier. And I think that's the true part. We can manage them differently. And if we manage them differently, we may reduce disease. In fact, I'm pretty sure we will. Um, this study is referred to quite often, and um, 
and of course it's only one shelter, but it's a really nice illustration for how we can affect outcome by affecting length of stay. And in the next slide, in case that one is completely confusing, this one I think is a little easier. It's the same data represented differently. And I'm not going to talk all about Kaplan-Meier, um, mostly because I wouldn't even try. But what we're looking at here is it's easier to understand, perhaps, that this method depicts the exact same data, but it shows the cumulative probability of breaking with an upper respiratory by the days in the shelter. And again, it's broken into age groups, although the trend is exactly the same. Um, in both of these, kittens, obviously, um, were at a greater risk, and, and so were some of the senior animals with adults having a slightly lower risk, like those ones in the mid-range. Um, but what we see here is that as you approach day seven in the shelter, uh, the cumulative probability was 30% for almost all of the age groups. And then as we approach 80 or day 14, we approach almost 80%. And so if they've been in the shelter up to two weeks, you're looking at almost 80% probability that they're going to break with an upper respiratory. So again, it speaks to the fact that managing length of stay and looking at some of these strategies really can make a difference um, for our animals, and in particular, this is, this is for cats. So Dr. Scarlett also referred to the importance of goal setting in your shelters and using data to do that, and, and I'm going to emphasize that again, that you can use data to set goals for your shelter and your staff. Um, and these are things that should be prioritized with your staff and spoken about with your staff. And don't be surprised if one small change you make actually affects multiple goals. You may start with only a single goal, but the truth is, is that because the shelter is a system, um, you're going to have multiple things affected by those small incremental changes that you make. You should absolutely celebrate your successes. If it is one day less in your length of stay for a month, that is something to celebrate. And I'll tell a little story here about San Francisco SPCA um, and my friend Dr. Scarlett out there who, who put up a length of stay board for her staff. And so there was a whiteboard tracking length of stay. And every day everybody walked by it. And you know, again, at first, people will say to you, well, we can't work any differently. We can't work any faster. Nothing's really going to change. And when you start to see those numbers go down, People get excited, and it becomes something really to work towards. Um, and so celebrating your success is really, really important. And don't expect success overnight. None of this happens immediately. Um, and so it really involves kind of persevering and accepting those small successes in, in search of the bigger ones. So this is some actual data from a shelter where the goal was to reduce the median length of stay. That was the the primary goal at the outset, um, with, a, with the idea that this would decrease um, the population in the shelter, the census in the shelter, um, and decrease overcrowding, which was certainly a problem at that point. And so you can see this is a shelter that we started consulting with in May of 2010. And so the blue line is uh, 2008, the yellow line is 2009. And what's important there is that there was another change in the shelter. 2009, May 2009, they opened an off-site adoption annex. And so there was some, that certainly helped initially, I think, with that. But we still see that peak that came along in the late summer. And I'm, if we have time at the end, I'm going to spend a little time talking about off-site annexes, even though I promised I wasn't going to focus on adoption, because it's, it's a good example of where numbers can help you in thinking through a problem. Um, 2010, May of 2010 is when we began consulting with the shelter and really kind of worked on making this a goal and setting up some strategies. And we certainly saw the length of stay start to come down, um, with the exception of it looks like somewhere in November we had a little bit of a peak. And then the numbers in 2011, I think it's safe to say there have been some pretty significant changes in, in the median length of stay. Um, a quick note on median length of stay versus average. In using some of the software programs, I know for PetPoint, if you use their length of stay reporting, it can be a little difficult um, because those are using averages. And without getting too much into the epi of it, average length of stay, average is really designed for normally distributed data, that good old bell curve that you saw back when you looked at your grades in high school. Um, and so that's more designed for that. Length of stay doesn't tend to be a bell curve. It tends to have kind of a long tail, perhaps a long right tail. And so we do think that median may be more accurate depiction on not to say. We don't know that for sure, but it's what we've tried to pull out. Um, it takes a little bit more work. It takes putting the information into access and then working through Excel to 
kind of look at median length of stay, but that's what our numbers are, um, that at least for this presentation, that's what I have this evening. A secondary goal to decreasing the length of stay, because that was kind of uh, the first thing was to kind of get the animals through, and there was a, a big backlog at that point, um, was to actually end up reducing the average daily census. And again, that was a secondary goal that we assumed or hoped would happen if we managed the time in the shelter better. And this is the same shelter, same data. In fact, certainly that is what appears to have happened. And again, 2010, we still kind of see that same late summer um, hitch with the cats. And then moving into 2011, the numbers are definitely down. There were certainly some adoption promotions that aided in that um, and a push at times. But ultimately, it was the combination. It was the entire system working together that allowed that average daily census to come down. And so I hope at least this gives you an idea. It really can work. And now we'll get into kind of how it works. Goal setting also speaks to rewards. And again, I just wanted to remind everyone, and I always have to use this picture of the cat with the target training. Um, to, to find your targets and define your players, report on your progress, be ready to reevaluate, and don't give up too soon because this stuff, stuff does take time. So the first part of it, as you're starting to look at your shelter, is figuring out where are the bottlenecks in your own system. And this is going to take a little bit of self-assessment. And so you can use data to do this. It can be hard within the pieces, but you can start to look at it. It can be your software data, or it may be something that you just tally over a month of time with some hash marks on a piece of paper. Um, I'm, I'm, again, trying not to focus on adoption, but I wanted to say something about adoption bottlenecks in the sense that sometimes adoption bottlenecks are occurring because of other parts of the in-shelter system that are, are bottlenecking. And in particular, I've, walked, I've spent some time in shelters where the adoption areas seem full um, but an, and animals are waiting, and yet the animals in adoption aren't completely ready to go. Now, sometimes there's reasons for that, and, and we can talk about that too. Sometimes it actually helps you to put animals on the floor even if they're still waiting for surgery or they're on stray hold, depending on what the situation is in your shelter. But at other times, you may have animals in adoption that are waiting to get spayed neutered after adoption, They've been adopted, but they, they need to wait for other procedures or for whatever reason the adoption is delayed. And in those situations, it may be other aspects of your shelter that are causing your adoption to back up. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of look at that. If you have animals that have already essentially been adopted and are still waiting in your shelter to get spayed and neutered, then that's a sign that your spay and neuter is a huge bottleneck. And, and I would argue that it behooves you to kind of push through and catch up with that, make sure you're providing appropriate um, resources for spay and neuter, and to kind of do a big push to get ahead of the curve. Um, because it makes a lot, sen a lot of sense to just get them spayed and neutered as soon as possible, especially if the trend is, is that if an animal makes it to the adoption floor, they're going to make it to adoption. And in that case, let's make sure that they're just ready to go so that they can go. And that, I think, is the last time I'm going to say the word adoption, even though I promised I was going to talk about it. Um, the other ones that I'm spending a lot more time on is in-shelter bottlenecks. And so the problem there may be that you walk out into your adoption area and you have empty spaces. And yet, meanwhile, you have lots of animals backed up in holding. And common areas for these bottlenecks are spay-neuter surgeries, behavior evaluations, medical evaluations, intake exams, um, stray holds. Because they have illness or because they are um, in foster or waiting for foster. And so the, the irony of this is that you may have empty spaces on your adoption floor that actually lead to adoption failures because there just simply aren't enough animals to choose from. Now, it may be that, you're, that your maximum adoption capacity should be a little bit lower. But the truth is, is that if you've got animals backed up and you've got spaces on your adoption floor and you've got people who are coming in and not adopting, then it's time to figure out how to get them there faster. So identifying bottlenecks and flow through. Uh, this is actual data, again, from the, from the shelter, the same shelter. And my guess is if that you've already thought about overcrowding, you've probably thought about your length of stay, and you may even already know where your bottlenecks are. You may not need data to do that, but it certainly can help define if you're having trouble. Items that can play into these, again, a lot of the things we already talked about, stray hold illness, 
undergoing behavior modification, all these things that keep animals from getting there. And if you look at this data, in 2000, and I hope it's a little bit bigger on your screen than on mine, but 2008, 2009, there were some pretty significant waits uh, for cats to make it to the adoption floor. And there may very well be reasons for that, depending on what's happening in the shelter at the time. The other dynamic uh, that I've become more aware of is that as you take on more treatable animals, you may actually increase the time it takes to get to the adoption floor, because they may need ongoing medical treatment before they get to go on the adoption floor. They may need behavioral modification. And so again, taking into account what your goals are, are really important. But what I come back to all of the time is what is the shortest path for this particular animal? And it shouldn't spend one day more than what that shortest path is. So let's talk about some strategies. And coming back to our reminding ourselves of our schemata, again, what I'm going to focus on most is that there are some for the yellow. We want to slow down owner surrender and stray intake. And that can happen in our shelter. And I'll briefly go over those. And then there are lots to do in the green section and with foster return to owner and our lovely shelter stay. Um, I always look for a title to give the people who kind of, I give them the job of monitoring the animals that are in the shelter. And we'll talk about daily rounds, which is a big part of that. And, and I've come to Flobies which for those of you who I'm dating myself with that, but it's, it's this lovely device that you can hook up to a vacuum in order to cut your own hair and vacuum the hair into the vacuum. Um, but it also, for me, flow bees touches on that idea of getting, these, getting the animals to flow through the shelter, and bees are so industrious. And so that's become my own little, my own little catchphrase there. Um, so find yourself some flow bees. Usually it helps if there's somebody with a moderate case of, of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, because they're the ones who will really stay on top of it. And if you happen to be one of those people, even so, even better. So counseling at surrender is one way that you can turn around. So we're going to talk about those yellow areas first and reduce, reducing intake. And there are a couple good webinars out there about this in terms of intake diversion and trying to redirect owners. Um, and that's not to deny them services, but to redirect owners so that they can um, perhaps find other resources in the community. And I'll just simply list these. Um, surrender by appointment. A lot of shelters have gone to surrender by appointment so that they have the opportunity to actually talk to owners about other things that may be available. Some of this can happen on the phone, even prior to the owners coming to the shelter, if space is a concern and you're trying to run your surrenders right next to your adoption foster to surrender programs or adoption programs, rehoming, and there's lots of resources on this that I include at the end. Um, pet friendly housing resources so that people don't have to give up their pets when they move, behavior resources in the community, TNR programs, community cat programs, and then pet food pantries. More and more shelters that I've spoken with have some kind of feeding program or even some subsidized veterinary care, some resources for that to try and keep animals in need with their owners. Um, pet ID is another big area, and I know the ASPCA is doing a lot of work on this in trying to increase pet ID as a mission in their communities and making sure that people have access to collars and tags and microchips. A study done out in Oklahoma um, with Emily Weiss from the ASPCA looked at giving a free collar and tag at adoption and then followed up with the owners. And at a, on those follow-up calls, 94% of them were still wearing their collar and tag with a mean of eight weeks following adoption. So these things can be successful. Um, certainly most of you are familiar with Linda Lord's work in terms of microchips um, and how they can help with return to owners. And obviously using technology and social media is really important in terms of getting your stray animals out there and, and noticed. So on to a poll question for a couple of details. Okay, so when microchipped, the percentage of stray cats returned to their owner increased from approximately 2% to approximately what percent? 4%, 10%, 20%, 40%, or 80%? So when microchipped, the percentage of stray cats returned to their owner increased from approximately 2% to approximately what percent? So this, this looks like you're a, a quiz. 
Dr. Berlinger, are you, are you I know, I it? can't help it. The teacher in me came out for a moment. <laughs> okay, so I will go ahead and push the latest results. So it's 3%. Excellent. Four superstars out there. Yeah. I think I'll just let you look at the slide. Okay. So 48% um, so of you got it. 40%. So it takes the return to owner from 2% to 40%. Cats are 20 times more likely to get back to their owner. Um, and 40% still doesn't impress me all that much, but it's certainly better than two. Um, and of course, the breakdown in that is registering the microchips. And so whatever we can do and encourage our local hospitals to do to increase that enrollment is critical. But certainly a microchip helps the cat a lot. Now it's for another quiz question. All right, when microchipped, the percentage of stray dogs returned to an owner increased from approximately 20% to approximately what percent? 30%, 50%, 70%, 90%, or there is no change. So we'll give you a moment to answer that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and push the results. Here you go, Dr. Berlinger. And so it's actually closer to 50%. And so lower than you would think, but they're about two and a half times more likely to end up back with their owner. And again, this comes from Linda Lord's work, and I have the reference at the end. Um, so dogs have a better chance um, overall because they also a lot of times need to be licensed, et cetera. Um, but dogs have a better chance of getting back to their owners. So proactive management of strays, I'll cover this really briefly. Um, some shelters have found that open selection is really helpful, so putting adoptable strays in the public view rather than keeping them in stray hold with a sign like, like me, I'll be available. And this is a way to kind of get them moving, so if somebody is available, and to, um, if somebody is interested in them, then immediately following their stray hold, we already have applications in process. Certainly, some communities have been lucky to change legislation in terms of um, redefining litters of puppies and kittens so that they're not considered stray because not many people go looking for their stray litter of kittens, at least not in my community. Um, beha performing behavioral evaluations during stray hold can certainly help speed things along. And vaccinating strays at intake for infectious diseases, extremely important in terms of proactive management of your population. Another area, looking at that foster section, that little foster green arrow, is really keeping track of your foster animals. And in particular, I'm thinking of your pediatrics here that you may have sent out of the shelter uh, because they weren't old enough to be adopted or spayed and neutered, but you definitely don't want to lose track of them because if they get backed up in foster, then you still have the same issue of not having enough foster placements for more that come in. And so it's extremely important that you track your foster care inventory via software, statistics, Proactive planning for foster needs, so know how many foster homes you have, how many litters they can take without overcrowding, important. And then average length of stay in foster, and get them back as soon as possible. So if most of you, I'm sure, have pediatric spay neuter in place in your shelter or have the ability to do that. Let's get them back at eight weeks of age as long as they're healthy. Let's get them spayed and neutered. Let's get them on the floor and let's get them adopted. Um, and so certainly, let's just keep moving that system along. We don't want that to back up any more than we want our shelter to back up. So reducing in-shelter delays, all sorts of things we've talked about. Intake exams are important in terms of preventive medicine, um, risk assessment, and pathway identification. And there's a whole webinar on this that I strongly recommend if you didn't catch it. Catch Dr. Brian Deganji's webinar on the, the critical importance of good intake exams. Certainly managing their stress and health, uh, health is important. Population rounds, I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time on that. Getting behavior evaluations done in a timely fashion. Proactive medical treatments, and I'll say a word here that it's really, sometimes it's, it's more important to me to get diagnostics up front if it's gonna direct treatment in a more successful manner. In private practice, veterinarians often have the ability to kind of you know, treat and see response to treatment. Uh, make their best guess and, and, and try something and see how it works. If a diagnostic test could help you make a more targeted plan for that animal that may speed that process along, then I think it's important to invest that money up front and to try and do that more proactively. And then obviously meeting stay and neuter needs as we've already discussed. So the intake exams, a big important part. I hope all of you are doing this vaccinated intake for common infectious diseases used modified live or recombinant vaccination. It works fast, um, it's effective. 
almost every animal, and I really mean almost all, all animals. There are very few exceptions to that. Train your staff to screen animals for infectious disease. Um, there's obviously not usually a veterinarian doing every exam on every animal that comes in. That, that's usually highly inefficient, but a trained staff member can do a great job. And this kind of goes over all the details again with vaccinations, micro, uh, microchip scanning to make sure we get those animals back to their owners if we can, assessing risk of disease, and then kind of pathway planning, um, fast track versus slow track. I like sprinters versus distance runners. Something about the slow makes me think of the slow reading group in grammar school. But um, some of these guys can go sprinting right, to, right through the system. Maybe they're already spayed and neutered. They're healthy, they're young, they're adoptable. Um, they're kittens that just need to be spayed and neutered and moved along. Those guys can sprint to adoption. And, uh, and those distance runners may take a little bit more work, may need some medical treatment behavioral, but they're going to get there too. Proactive stress and management, appropriate housing we've talked about. A lot of this is more for your notes because we've already talked about it. Making sure you have separate areas for kittens versus cats, like we said, sick animals versus healthy animals. Um, stray hold animals, species separate, obviously important, and ages. Um, enrichment is really important. In, a lot of times animals on the adoption floor get a lot of enrichment, but those in holding don't necessarily get enough. Um, and so don't forget those areas. Those guys need enrichment too. They're under stress. They may be ill. Let's try to get some things going in, that, in those areas to try and help them. Uh, treatment protocols can be very helpful to speed things along and keep animals healthy when veterinarians aren't available all the time. It's much nicer to have protocols in place that staff can start and the proactive medical treatments I already talked about. And that's my little guy right there because he needs stress relief on his pillow. Um, timely behavior evaluations. This is a bit of a debate. You notice I have lots of question marks there. But whether you do them during stray holds, after stray holds, whether you do them at intake, that's been one way in um, highly overcrowded shelters to really try and get a sense of that animal at intake. Does it make a difference to wait the three to five days until their stress drops down or does it make it worse? Again, all areas of debate and I think it depends on the shelter um, and the animal to some degree, but it's certainly worth talking about. Can we do them earlier um, if, in tr if indeed capacity is a major problem in our shelter? Timely spay neuter, and again, animals should not wait for surgery. Increase your staff if you need to. Maybe you just need to increase your staff support for your surgeons. Maybe your surgeons need some high volume training um, or some training in pediatrics if they're not comfortable at doing them at eight weeks. So figure out what it's gonna take to kind of move that system along because you don't want animals waiting, waiting for that service. And daily rounds, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on this because if there's anything I think that affects flow through in a shelter, I think it's the institution of daily rounds. And no, it's not the same thing as medical rounds. It's not the same as inventory, and it's not duck, duck, goose. Um, it's a team approach to problem solving, and it comes back to that idea that individual care meets population management, that care of the particular animal affects the system overall. And so the players in daily rounds can be varied, but usually there's a representative from medical management or the medical team. There's somebody from behavior, somebody from operations, somebody from foster, maybe there's some others. And you'll notice this looks very similar to the list of who plays a role in flow through planning. And that's not a coincidence because those are the key people to kind of getting, getting the system in place. The skinny is that it needs to be a physical walk through the shelter. So it's not the same thing to print out an inventory list and kind of review it. Um, or kind of stand in a room and remember who's in places. It's really important that you walk through the shelter and stop at each cage as a team. And you want to ask yourself some questions. And they're pretty simple. Who, who are you? Who is the animal in the cage? What condition are they in? What do they need right now? What is the plan for that animal overall? And what can we do today to facilitate that plan? How can we get this animal moving? So we're going to go through a couple of patients. Here's a kitty, and this is not the best picture because we're not far enough back to see the cage, but a very simple discussion of this cat in rounds. We'd all stand in front of the cage and make sure this cat has ID so we know who it is. We see what condition they're in, so we can't do a complete assessment at this moment of its health, but we certainly see this cat is in its litter box and doesn't look too excited. This cat right now probably needs a hide box and may need some other things. Um, what is the plan for this kitty? 
Well, I'm going to hope that if this is an owner surrender kitty that's already been spayed and neutered, we may actually talk about if we need to behaviorally assess this kitty and then get a move to adoption. Um, if this is a kitty that needs some work, then maybe we need to talk to the foster person in charge of foster or someone about getting this kitty where it needs to go. And I'm going to skip patient number two. We're going to move to patient number three because I have a video and, and you've all hung in there and been so diligent that it's time you get to see a video of cute puppies. So we'll see if we can get the video going. But this is patient number three. This is a five-month-old puppy in a holding ward. So I'm hoping that you got the audio on that, because if your data around the team has made it to this page, there should be some concerns. For one, the puppy has eaten its ID on the front of the cage, so we may want to revisit how we can keep this pu puppy properly identified. Um, for another, I ask myself, why is this puppy still in the holding area when it's demonstrating coughing and some signs of illness? And then it's going to take not only a medical staff member, but probably an, a management person and or a foster person or an adoptions person to figure out what is now our plan for this puppy. Are we going to move it to the infirmary? Is there another option rather than moving it to the infirmary, depending on what our, the housing in our infirmary? What can we do for this dog? We need, to, we need to get him out of the holding situation, stop exposing other animals, and yet we also need to figure out what's the most humane course for this particular pet. Patient number four, this kitty cat, this is a geriatric cat that came into the shelter and had been living in a nursing home, um, came in when the owner died, and there was some concern that the cat could have been exposed to MRSA because of the situation with the owner. And so the cat stayed in the shelter for a little bit. Her name is Snuggles. She stayed in the shelter, had some diagnostic testing, which took a few days to come back, had already been spayed and neutered, but needed some dental work. So she had some time in the shelter for a while in a small cage and made it through all of that and then was released to the adoption floor. And when she made it to the adoption floor, this is what your daily rounds team sees as they're moving around on that particular day. And so it becomes apparent that our assessment of her in a cage or under treatment perhaps has missed something. And I'm hoping it's apparent to you too. It's a little easier when she's walking away from you. But Snuggles has a little bit of a hitch in her giddy up. And it probably hasn't been made any better by being in a small cage um, for the week or so that it took. And certainly it didn't seem to be apparent to the elderly owner in the nursing home. No one ever said anything that there was an issue. And so now the concern is, is what can we do for her? Is there something we need to do medically? Or is this a chronic degenerative condition? Um, can she remain on the adoption floor? Is she okay in the place that she's in? Um, is there anything that else that we need to do for her as a team? And this is the kind of decision that could get caught in daily rounds when you can make these decisions together as a team rather than trying to work as independent units and kind of catch each other in email, et cetera. We're all observing this and it's a problem-solving session in the moment for this cat, and it's her best chance of something getting done quickly and effectively to, to get her into a home or to get her into a place that's appropriate. And so helpful hints for daily rounds. The first thing that you're going to think is, we do not have any more time in our day to get daily rounds done, and that's usually what people say to me. And what I say is, you need to do it. It will ultimately save you time, and it absolutely is true. It's hard to get started, but pick a sacred time every day, and it is sacred, and everyone shows up. You call on the PA system. Everyone comes. Move efficiently. So you hear I speak pretty quickly. This needs to happen. We need to stay on task, and we need to move efficiently through the shelter and make these decisions. Create a task list or an action item list, things that you are going to accomplish from this. Um, and, and really strategize so that it gets done in the time. Different systems work. Some people use color-coded cards. Some people use stickers to note some, something on the cage cards. There are various charts that you, can, that you can create. But come up with a system to make sure that things get tagged and they get done. Designate a leader, and that can be one of your Flobies, one of your more OCD members. But it's their job to kind of corral people and help people get it done, or, or help things get done. 
and certainly act now. The faster that we can accomplish the things that are on our list, then the faster the animals move along. And I'm going to take a moment, and I know we're running a little bit over, but I'm going to just mention a book club moment here because I am a complete nerd and a former English major, and I want to refer to the, uh, one of my favorite authors, Atil Gawande, who's a surgeon, a human surgeon, who's done a lot of work at looking at trying to decrease complications. And he has multiple books. This is the third book in a series, Complications Better and the Checklist Manifesto. And he's, he's really obsessed with trying to decrease complications in human surgeries. And so he studies systems, various systems, flights um, and clinics and other places where people deal with a complex amount of information. And many, many people are involved in every case and tried to figure out a way to kind of hone things down. And he came up with this idea of checklists. And what's important to understand is that these checklists are not protocols. They aren't directions. They aren't a guide to how to do something for someone who's never done it before. What they are are reminders for people who know their job very well, but sometimes because there's so much information swirling, um, they need a reminder. And that's what these checklists work as. And I've been playing with this idea a lot in terms of how it works in a shelter, where we've got so many people and so many animals and so many different parts to getting those animals successfully through. And so these checklists can be really helpful in terms of trying to narrow down what are the things I need to be reminded of. And in a sense, daily rounds acts like a daily checklist for some of these animals. And it increases communication. And what was interesting to me is he even talks about the fact that an unexpected consequence of these surgical checklists was really the improved communication that occurred among the staff. And this takes us back to that idea of a cultural shift. You've got your team together making decisions, talking about these cases, figuring out how to move animals along. And what that really did is it increased the level of communication among the team, and that's exactly what happens. And in these, in these surgical cases, they saw the greater the improvement in teamwork, the greater the drop in complications. And I think that, that I've seen that in the shelters as well, that you really see a change. Um, and a lot of that comes from communication among the staff members. So at this point, I just want to show you, we'll return quickly to just looking at our, we've talked about the entire system in the shelter. I did have another example. I'm going to go ahead and skip that so we can get to some of your questions. Um, but that will be in the notes, and I'm happy to answer questions on it at, at some point in the future. I do want to say a couple thank yous. Um, thank you, obviously, to Maddie's Fund and to Dr. Lori Peake um, for helping host this this evening. I appreciate them and all of the, the support that they've given our program. Certainly Dr. Jan Scarlett, who every day helps me find out a little bit more about EPI um, and for all of the mentoring that she's provided. Dr. Michael Greenberg, who um, has been very involved in looking at our data and helping with the documentation. Our interns um, in the past, obviously Dr. Newberry, who I mentioned, Dr. Hurley, Dr. Wagner, for their ongoing work and our lovely cat our lovely cat cages, and Froman Lee is a computer technician that we roped into helping us as well with access and some of the data that you saw this evening. Lots of references um, out there if you've got questions about where some of these things came from. And finally, um, some of the resources that I may have mentioned, I believe some of these will be in the, on the page, the Maddie's Institute page as well, if you're looking for where some of this came from, or Dr. Deganji's webinar. And with that, I will take questions. Excellent. Was that your little puppy in the um, picture on the th on the thank you slide? Yes, that was also yeah. my little puppy. That was my oh. own personal disaster. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay, so here we have a question. I'm on the board of a large uh, rescue, and I'm highly involved, hands-on volunteer. I also have an MBA. I'm desperately trying to determine capacity and urge them to slow down intake. We are always over healthy capacity because they are making emotional decisions and so resistant to change. I am determined to help them, so I need your help. There is a lot there, and it is exactly the situation that I've tried to describe, so I understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, and it's a situation in a lot of shelters because we want to help as many animals as possible. It's really hard to slow down intake when you see the need in your community. Um, and again, what it can come down to is it may be that you can take more animals if you can move them through your system faster. And so what it really takes is kind of this assessment process of stepping back and figuring out where are, where are we getting caught up? Where are the bottlenecks in the system? 
and then how do we address those bottlenecks individually? And it's funny that you have an MBA. That's, that's really um, interesting and, and a coincidence and probably. But I think part of this is really kind of getting an assessment. And it's going to mean that somebody, somebody in the shelter, whether it's the management um, that kind of steps back and says, okay, where are our bottlenecks? What can we do? Whether you get an outside assessment or a consultation from a shelter medicine program or one of the programs to come in and kind of look at your system. I mean, that's what we do when we go into shelters is try and assess how the system is working and then where things can change to increase the flow through. So you may need to get outside resources for this. Um, but certainly it's the kind of thing that is so thrilling to do because once you see it work and you see those animals and you realize that they're healthier and you realize that you can help more of them that way, um, then you really start to believe, okay, you know, this can actually work. But it's really, really hard when, when you are already stretched too far and you're already having a hard time meeting the capacity to, to be creative. Um, and so it really needs to be a combination of that. And it may mean bringing somebody in from the outside with a fresh eye to take a look and, and help you. Excellent. Here's your next question. Capacity planning. How would you determine maximum capacity for a communal cat room? That is a really good question. And I didn't show the capacity assessment for the communal rooms um, with the shelter, that same shelter. And so there are different measurements, and certainly the standards can help you for that. So we have guidelines in the standards. Um, eight, there's one published recommendation of 18 square feet per cat in a communal cat room. In another one, it's as low as 11 square feet per cat. Um, I don't know that we really have a firm number. And what you do take into account is both what's on the ground and the vertical spaces, because cats use their vertical space a lot, and so it can count into increasing your capacity. And some of that may be the way the rooms are set up, and it may be a little bit of a feeling. And I hate to say that, because I'd much rather talk about science, but feelings sometimes play a role. Um, so when we've done it, we've taken measurements of the rooms, um, and then we've looked at the numbers and how they fit kind of into that range. And then we've looked at the room itself, and you know what kind of vertical space does it offer? Um, what is the arrangement? Remembering that you want to make sure you can keep your food and your litter separate, making sure that um, you have enough litter boxes for the number of cats you're putting in. And I would argue, personally, I'm not comfortable with more than eight to 10 cats ever in a room, regardless of how big the room is. So it's not a, a particularly perfect calculation. If you have a giant gymnasium, it's not like you would say, okay, we have a giant gymnasium, it, you know, and they only need 18 square feet per cat, so we can put, you know, 200 cats in this room. Obviously, it wouldn't work like that. And so there is kind of a maximum with what you think even a large room should have. And although I, I would honestly say that's probably 8 to 10 cats for me, and you may get other opinions from other people, and it may depend on the space. But a place to start is kind of that range. Let's look at 11 is the low end, 18 is the high end. Let's look at vertical spaces, and then let's look at the room. Um, and I kind of make jokes because there's one large room in one of the shelters that we visit frequently, and um, at one time they had too many cats in that room. It was, it was pretty overcrowded. And I talked to them about that, and we got it down, and we got it down, and it was looking better. And then they one day turned it into the obese cat room. Um, and so it had the right number of cats, but they were all very, very large cats. And so then I questioned whether I had to start defining the capacity of that room by poundage in that room. Um, and, and luckily, we didn't have to go that far. And yes, we do have a weight management plan for our obese cat. Um, but, but sometimes it's not as crystal clear as a perfect number. That is interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Here is your next question. What is the most difficult change to implement in your experience? Mm, that's a good question. I think the most difficult change was the, or the early ones was the first one, and that is to some degree looking at the actual physical capacity. And that doesn't seem like it should be that hard. But if, if the culture has been, we have this many cages, therefore we have this many cats, that can be a really hard thing to change. And certainly convincing people to retrofit their cages and put in portholes and essentially cut their physical capacity in half can be a really difficult battle. And, 
And those conversions, all those rooms didn't occur at once. It was over a period of time, and it was in it certainly wasn't the first thing we did. So the first thing I did was get rid of the cages that really weren't appropriate, and then worked on other things to get the population down. And then once it was down, start to actually improve the, the actual housing that we had. Um, and some of that came from grant writing, too, to get some better caging units to replace some of the older ones. But as you know, cages aren't cheap. Um, and I, I make sure every veterinary student that walks through shelters knows what cages cost because they're always absolutely shocked. It's one of my favorite questions to ask them. But I would actually say that that was probably the hardest part because it was a physical, visible change that people were so uncomfortable with because they were sure that they were sure they were going to need those cages again. They were sure that they weren't going to be able to decrease the population in the shelter, and they were really afraid of not being able to serve the animals and serve the community. Um, and, and so fear comes into that, and history comes into that, and the current culture comes into that. And those are the things that take a really long time to affect. And sometimes it takes, a really, it takes until you have success. It takes until, for me, the staff bought in when the animals were healthy and healthier and when they really saw it. And that was months. And for some of them, it may have even been a year until they suddenly looked around and went, wow. Um, and I remember the, the, I remember the first day that one of the infirmaries was empty, and it was, it was this shock to everyone. Um, what is going on? How is this possible? We've never been here before. So, you know, it, it can take a long time. It really can. OK, so here's their last question. All, all the time we have, so there are a lot of other questions, so uh, hopefully we'll have you answer these questions and we can mm -hmm. post them later. Um, but for, for time's sake, here's your last question. How important is medical isolation quarantine at time of intake in an open admission facility? That's a great question. And so we've really gotten away, and I'm going to break down the words. So we're going to use isolation to describe where we put ill animals. That is official isolation. We've used quarantine in the past to kind of describe holding all animals. But the truth is, is that quarantine is what we do with animals who have been exposed to disease and we're waiting to see if they get sick. And kind of historically, I think the thinking was, well, any, any of the animals that come in our facility could have been exposed to disease, and we're gonna, so we're going to quarantine them all. But the problem with that thinking is that then they stay longer in our shelter, and they end up getting sick because they're there longer. And so we're actually taking animals that are healthy and ending up exposing them to disease in the process of quarantining. What I think is most important is actually neither of those, but having intake protocols that not only provide preventive care, meaning vaccination at intake for infectious diseases, the cats get FBRCP, modified live, not killed, um, and dogs get DHPP and Bordetella. Again, use modified live DHPP um, or recompetent. Get the vaccinations at intake. Have effective intake evaluations. Train your staff to screen those animals. Do you see signs of illness? If you do, then get those on a veterinary checklist or a veterinary alert so that a veterinarian looks at them quickly and soon. Um, teach them how to screen for ringworm and look for lesions. Teach them how to look for signs of illness. And that screening is more important than either. If you're talking about when animals are coming into intake, that's the most important thing you can do rather than quarantining them. And then if they look healthy, let's move them along in the system. And again, obviously they could break with illness at some point. You have systems in place for monitoring that. You have people that are watching them medically. You have your care report staff reporting back. You have daily rounds, which are checking on them daily. So there's ongoing monitoring for those animals. And you have protocols in place to try and decrease the transmission of infectious disease um, with those animals. And so all of those things are playing a role together to, to discontinue a process of quarantining healthy animals. So you are moving them through the system rather than having them wait. Um, and that is really the most effective way of managing intake. Great, that's a good answer. Well, that's the end of our event. We want to thank Dr. Berlinger and all of you for your time tonight, especially those of you who needed something to do tonight. So we hope this has inspired you to help homeless animals in your community. For those of you who signed up to receive RACE CE, we will be emailing you your certificate within two weeks. 
Please click the link to take our survey. It may have been blocked by your pop-up blocker, or it may be on a different screen. If you didn't see it, we'll be emailing you the link, and we'd appreciate it if you could take a few moments to respond. We also invite you to come to maddiesinstitute.org and sign up for our mailing list, and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash maddiesinstitute, and on Twitter at maddiesinst, that's maddies, I-N-S-T. If you didn't get a chance to check out the resources and the widgets at the bottom of your screen, we'll be emailing the links to you as well as contacting the winners of our Maddie's Infection Control Manuals. We will also share the link to the archived version of tonight's webcast. So thanks again for being here with us this evening, and good night. <laughs>